Okay, so it's a pleasure to introduce to today's seminar guest. It's Jenny Tang. Um, Jenny works mainly with baboons, but also other primates, and she actually started already with her PhD doing that. She did her PhD in Duke, went on to Chicago, went back to Duke, and has been mostly studying interactions between genes and sociality of individuals and the interplay with it, but also has been looking at more what actually differentiates between individuals in a primate collective. So that's the link to collective behavior. And nowadays she actually is a Marx Planck director at the Marx Planck Institute of Primatology in Leipzig. So she is based in Germany and started her place position there last year. So it's still the kind of the getting used to Germany phase. And uh, as you can see, I mean, she survived. So I mean, that's- <laughs> What's the alternative? Yeah, well, what's the alternative, <laughs> right. So, okay. And so what shall I say else? I mean, probably I give the hand the word over to you and we're really looking forward to a talk that will tell us more about baboons, wild ones. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks very much, Michael. And thank you for your hospitality. I've had coffee and tea and chocolate and all kinds of good things today on my visit. And thanks to you all for, for coming out. Um, so I usually like to start these sorts of talks, since I know people work on a lot of different systems and come from a lot of different places, just introducing you to my study system. So these are wild baboons living on a savanna ecosystem in Kenya, um, right on the border between Kenya and Tanzania to the south. These are two, as you can probably tell, um, infants in our study population, both born last August. Tost is a, um, a young male, and Tsunami is a young female, born just a few weeks apart. Let me reintroduce you <laughs> um, to our, our uh, two of the newer members of our population, Tost and Tsunami. Um, they're members of the same social group, meaning that for a number of years um, from now, they will uh, range together, they will feed in close proximity, and they'll sleep in the same sleeping trees, um, such that the major determinants of how their day goes will have a lot to do with how they interact with one another and with the other animals animals in their social group. Um, if they survive the sort of dangerous early life period in four to six years, they'll become reproductively mature animals themselves, at which point in time Tsunami, as a female, will likely stay in her, in her natal social group throughout her life, and Tost will um, leave his group in search of reproductive opportunities elsewhere. If we are lucky as researchers, we'll get to see this entire process unfold. In fact, we've already now documented the first nine months of their lives and the experiences of their mothers when these two animals were in utero. If we're able to follow them until they either die or disappear, it means we'll also be able to watch the dynamics of their social relationships over their life course, how they respond to sources of environmental adversity, and ultimately uh, document their evolutionary success or failure in terms of their contributions to the next generation. We don't use particularly sophisticated technology to do this. Basically, the way we do that is to um, rinse and repeat the process that you see here. This is our senior field observer, Kenyo Wariteri, who's been watching baboons in this ecosystem since 1995. And this is what we do on a near daily basis, every day other than Sundays. There he is, unobtrusively watching a group of habituated baboons to document what they're eating, who they're hanging out with, what their reproductive status looks like, and so on, again, from birth until death or disappearance. This type of approach is the foundation, it's the backbone of all of the work that I'll tell you about today. Um, I'm lucky enough to do this work as part of the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project. This is a long-term field study of baboons, as you've already seen, that's now been um, ongoing for about 52 years, since 1971, um, about nine baboon generations or so at this point with our longest, our deepest match lines. The project was founded um, in 71 by Jean Altman and her husband Stuart Altman, and Jean remains involved as um, a director emerita of the, of the project. 
Um, the collaboration as a whole is currently led by um, my colleagues Beth Archie at the University of Notre Dame and Susan Alberts at Duke University in the United States. And we all bring different types of perspectives to the table, but the work I'll tell you about today is, is highly collaborative between all three of our labs. And of course, I would be remiss without acknowledging the um, professionalism and intensive efforts of our Kenyan field team. The four people that I've highlighted here are the ones who are responsible for the vast majority of the demographic and behavioral data collection that um, my talk will draw on. Rafael Mutatua, in particular, um, is our, our project manager in the field. And he has been watching um, baboons in Ambicelli since 1981. In addition to, oh, sorry, I should go back to this. So um, I showed you a picture of our animals introducing to infants in particular. And that's because for many years, we've had reason to believe that this period of an animal's life um, is in a particularly important period in life to document in fine detail. So as an example, I put up a paper that was published by Stuart Altman, one of the project founders, in 1991. Here's Stuart in the field and in 75 doing much the same sort of thing that we do today, where he showed using, at the time, 1991, um, a data set of six female baboons that detailed information on diet in the first year of, the life, of, of life nevertheless seemed to have remarkable capacity to predict their lifetime reproductive success, even though their lifespans might range up to 20 or more years um, later. Um, Tost and Tsunami are of particular interest because although they look pretty healthy in this picture, um, they were born in the middle of um, two consecutive failed years of rainfall in Ambicelli. This is from January of this year, where it, um, this article points out that another failed wet season has hit the um, semi-arid and arid regions of Kenya, with the Ambi Ambicelli ecosystem alone losing a very, very large number um, of its large mammal population, including up to 3,872 wildebeest by the counts that Kenya Wildlife Service does. Baboons um, are interesting because they, in one sense, seem to be remarkably robust to these kinds of insults. They don't die off in large numbers during these very, very severe droughts. And we are actually on track to finishing this hydrological year with only about 150 millimeters of rainfall, meaning it'll be another bad year. Um, nevertheless, if they are developing during severe drought years, we have, again, many reasons to believe, including Stewart's early work, that it may be quite toxic to their development and their success in the future. Just to give you an idea, this is tossed in tsunami again with their likely father, Niet, in November 2022, when it should have been starting to rain in our ecosystem. And um, even for, for those of you who may not study baboons, you probably can get a sense that these are particularly skinny um, young infants who are having a, a pretty rough time uh, in their early life. So they seem to be bouncing back a little bit right now, but we are a little bit worried about um, the impending end to the long rains, which is really in the next few weeks. Um, work on major adversity early in life is actually perhaps best developed, despite the vast early life literature, early life effects literature in animals, in humans, where for reasons that you might be able to guess, we have deep interest in understanding how early life experiences translate to health and longevity even decades, multiple decades later in life. What I'm showing you here are data on adverse childhood experiences, so um, major sources of deprivation or disadvantage faced by um, infants and children before the age of um, maturation. And their consequences for age at death here, perhaps potentially six decades later in life. Um, ACEs in humans include um, uh, major resource disadvantage, um, exposure to physical abuse, um, uh, absence of, of parental support or institutionalized care, and so on. And the ACEs framework actually just adds up the number of exposures to those major sources of disadvantage. That simple index is one of the best predictors of age at death of shortened lifespan that we know about, right? So here you can see this gradient that really drops off when, when um, children are hit by many sources of adversity um, that translates into decades of lost life. It also translates into differences in the risk of a number of major 
uh, public health burdens, including diseases with as different etiologies as cancer, diabetes, heart disease, bronchitis, and so on. So these are really pervasive and very large effects. This has led to what's often referred to as the development of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Framework, which posits that these types of experiences in these critical or sensitive periods uh, early in life translate to disrupted neurodevelopment, which percolates throughout the lifespan to lead to higher morbidity rates as well as an earlier death. So this is a very, very simple framework, what one of my colleagues called an abiological framework when we started the work that we did a few years ago, which inspired by social science colleagues was simply to start defining what ACEs might look like in baboons and ask whether similarly a simple cumulative count of the number of exposures had predictive value for understanding um, really the, the, the survival components of fitness. These are the six um, uh, major sources of adversity that we recognize in our population. Being born to a, a low status mother, losing a mother before the earliest age of reproductive maturation, about age four um, for females in our population, being born to a socially isolated as opposed to a socially connected mother, having a competing younger sibling born after a relatively short interval, about one and a half years in our population, that's the shortest, it's the lowest quartile of interbirth intervals in Ambicelli, resource competition, which we index by group size, so realized resource competition within the social group, and of course, exposure to a major source of ecological adversity and food resource deprivation, which is induced by droughts like the one um, I've talked to you about already going on right now. So in 2016, we made our first attempt to ask about the relationship between baboon aces and longevity. And so what I'm showing you here are the results for females in our population starting from age four. So we weren't interested in whether early life adversity was immediately toxic, right? It was basically like a lightning strike that, you know, that led the baboon to die shortly thereafter, but whether instead somehow it was incorporated into their life experience in a way that shortened their lifespan much later in life. So that's why our survival curve start actually at age four. These are ACEs scores, the number of major adverse events that baby baboons experience, ranging from zero, that's about 20% uh, of our population, our silver spoon babies, to one, about a third of their population, two, and then those unfortunate 15% or so who are exposed to three or more repeated major sources of adversity. And those lines are reflected in the different colors shown here. This is about as clean of a result as I have ever produced in my entire career, and it's the sort of result that makes you think on the other side of it, oh, we didn't really need statistics for this. But we had never summarized our data in this particular way. And what it showed us is that whereas the median lifespan for a female in Ambicelli conditioned on reaching age four is about 18 or 19 years in this data set, for those females who experienced two or three major sources of early adversity, they had about a decade of lost lifespan. And just to help you interpret that, um, you know, at least in the States, I don't know if this translates here, we think about dog years as like a seven to one ratio, right? Yes, okay, I see some people nodding. Baboon years, it's about a three to one ratio, right? So if we were about to think about what that meant in the terms of our lifespans, that's two to three decades of lost life. It's a huge effect. Um, in case you're thinking, well, I don't really care about how long individuals live or how healthy they are. I really only care about the fundamental currencies of evolutionary biology. Let me show you that for baboons in our population, like many other long-lived animals, the thing that is the biggest determinant that explains about 85 to 90 percent of the variance in lifetime reproductive success is, in fact, how long these animals live. Fertility-related components of fitness, like inner birth interval, age at maturation, and so on, explain non-negligible, non-zero amounts of variance. But really, what it is, at least for female baboons, is this sort of semi-ticking clock where for ever, every 2.1 additional years of adult lifespan, she's likely to produce another live offspring. So a difference of magnitude of 10 years based on exposure to early life, means that right now, early life adversity is the m biggest predictive variable that we're aware of in terms of understanding variance in lifetime re reproductive success. 
So that was very interesting to us. And since then, um, much of the research programs of Susan, Beth, and myself through different angles have focused on trying to understand what's going on here. What are the mediating pathways that connect early life adversity to shortened lifespan, whether there are physiological echoes that we can detect, whether there's any uh, evidence that these responses to major early life adversity are adaptive versus sort of knock-on effects of animals trying to do the best of their bad job and so on. And this has been work that many collaborators, uh, graduate students, postdocs, technicians in our labs have contributed to. Um, and I want to make sure that I acknowledge this rather large collection of people, which doesn't even include the, the, you know, the full apparatus over time, who have made um, very important contributions to the way that we think about this process uh, in the baboons. As I said, since we identified this large effect on lifespan, we've been spending a lot of time relating measures of early life adversity on one hand to lots of different stuff on the other. And this is a graph that Beth recently put together summarizing some of the things that we know that early life adversity at least is associated with. Right. Ranging from behavioral measures to morphological measures to physiological measures to molecular measures. Um, I'll highlight just a few of these here. One of the things that I think is most interesting from the perspective of um, Darwinian fitness is that um, Matthew Zippel, former graduate student with the project and colleagues, showed that early life adversity not only shortens the lifespan and therefore the reproductive opportunities of females themselves, it also affects the probability that those females' offspring will survive to maturity. So in other words, there are intergenerational effects of early life adversity um, on, on, uh, uh, on events many years later. So for example, if a female baboon lost her own mother early in life, her kids, controlling for their own exposure to early life adversity, were less likely to survive to this sort of minimal age at maturation. You can see this here. These are offspring of females with, who did not suffer maternal loss versus offspring of females who did suffer maternal loss. And this is a large effect. So you get an amplification in the second and third generations of um, exposure to early life adversity. We have um, reason to believe that this is probably a function of maternal condition, that there's nothing sort of magically epigenetic going on here, but actually in terms of transgenerational inheritance, but rather that these moms are simply less able to get their kids through those highly vulnerable periods. Understanding that the, where those differences in condition come from is, of course, another question of its own. And in recent work that is on bioarchive but not yet, let, yet published, uh, another former graduate student with the project, Emily Levy, looked at um, long bone growth in those, those first um, few years of life using you know, remote uh, photogrammetry measures. So using lasers to calibrate the size um, and height of individuals. And what she's shown is that females who are exposed to especially early life drought and other sources of resource deprivation end up actually being a little bit shorter. It's these long bones here that seem to be affected, not so much the, the shoulder rump um, distance. And that's actually very congruent with what we know about human growth, where resource-based stunting actually tends to affect the growth of long bones like the femur and not so much the growth of the torso. In addition, um, we found that females who are exposed to a lot of early life adversity grow up to be relatively socially isolated themselves in adulthood, particularly when we measure their connections with other adult females. So that's shown here. This is that cumulative risk or ACEs index, again, ranging from silver spoon babies to kids who experienced a lot of adversity and a measure of social connectedness to females on the y-axis. This was a particularly interesting observation to us because in previous work, we and others had found that more socially integrated females in adulthood also experience lower mortality risk. So this is our first result um, in that vein from a 2014 paper showing the, um, uh, the survival curves for the top quartile of most socially integrated females versus the bottom quartile of most of integrated females, or the, rather the, the most socially isolated females. And this is a difference on the order of about two to three years. It also replicates previous work, which to my knowledge was the first report of this kind of phenomenon in 
a, in a natural uh, 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 animal, a natural mammal population, uh, on the baboons of um, the Marimi um, population in, in Botswana, where they showed much the same thing, the sort of separation of survival based on, in this case, the strength and reciprocity of social bonds. So that leads to a natural hypothesis, and one that we stuck in the discussion of some of our papers where directionally this all seems to make sense, right? So exposure to early life adversity predicts, predicts uh, greater social isolation in adulthood. Greater social isolation in adulthood predicts shorter lifespans. So maybe what's really happening is a path through this um, highly social behavior mediated route whereby early adversity kills you because you are isolated and lonely and have few social bonds as, as an adult. Again, everything goes in the right direction, um, but we wanted to test this in a more formal quantitative manner, which led us to start um, a collaboration with an expert in causal inference at Duke, Fan Li, in the Department of Statistical Science, and her graduate student at the time, Xu Shi Zhang, um, who put together a method for us to aggregate multiple sort of data types and actually ask the degree to which early adversity mediates effects on survival. So in the mediation models um, that Liz Lang, a uh, former postdoc with Susan, fit, we again recover this effect of early adversity where on, on lifespan, where each additional source of early adversity translates on average to a reduction in 1.6 years of life, of adult lifespan. And then um, the model also recovered this relationship that we had identified previously between early adversity and social relationships in adulthood. So individuals who experienced more adversity um, had slightly less strong social bonds as adulthood, as adults. And it also recapitulated the effect that we had described in Archie et al. and several other papers showing that individuals who were more socially integrated had stronger social bonds and so on live longer. Right, that increases lifespan. Um, one standard deviation here increases lifespan by about two years here. But in contrast to the motivating hypothesis for doing this, this mediating pathway only explained about 0.17 years of lost life um, between the, in the relationship between early adversity and adult lifespan. Okay? So there's a big effect here, and only a little tiny bit of it is explained by this path through social relationships. Most of it is still stuck instead, shunted over to this direct effect, meaning that we don't know what's causing this effect over here. This, there's still a residual unexplained 1.43 years of that 1.6 year estimate that doesn't go through this pathway. And really, um, it became fairly clear to us after we fit this model why this is a very big effect, and this is a very big effect. But this effect is actually pretty small. This translates to about 15% of one standard deviation of an effect. So while it's detectable in our data, in order for this mediating pathway to have a, a big role in the motivating phenomenon, this arrow would have to be thicker. It would have to be bigger, because we have to basically multiply these two things together to get this path. So there's an effect, but it seems to be fairly weak. And we get the same sort of result if we not only look at cumulative early life adversity, but individual sources of early life adversity. That is, often, there's a rather large total effect if you just look at the, early life adver the source of early life adversity and adult lifespan. But the mediated pathway is very small. It doesn't account for much change in lifespan, of loss in lifespan, meaning that that residual direct effect still remains quite large, even though in all of these models, the effect of social bonds as a protective influence is also quite large. Okay? So the first bit is always quite weak, and the second bit of that mediating pathway is always quite strong. But overall, that leads to a quite weak effect. One of the interesting other things that Liz found in this paper, which just came out last week, by the way, if you're interested in, in seeing more details, is that although that mediating pathway was weak, there was some evidence for a moderating effect, an interactive effect between adult social relationships and early life adversity. And you can see that here. So this is whether or not a female experience maternal loss earlier in life, yes or no. And this is the hazard ratio for mortality. So basically, being higher on the y-axis is worse for you. It's a, it's, a, it's a bigger predictor that you will die um, in any given year. 
And so experiencing maternal loss in general is bad for you in adulthood. But those individuals who experienced maternal loss um, but managed to maintain um, strong social bonds in adulthood have somewhat a lessened risk relative to an average individual or those individuals who experienced both early life adversity and were relatively socially isolated in adulthood. So this is not a major mediator, but it is an interesting moderator, suggesting somewhat independent effects of adult social relationships and early life adversity on survival and the potential to somewhat, um, the potential for some degree of resilience from early life adversity through the development of these strong social relationships. Okay. So another way to think about mediation between early life adversity and adult outcomes is to think about it in the context of what Clyde Hertzman and people working on um, early life effects in the human social sciences call biological embedding. This is the idea that the environment, particularly in early life, somehow gets under the skin, mean, meaning it modifies physiological and developmental processes such that systematic differences in experience and relative advantage and adversity lead to systematically different biological states, which remain stable over time and have the capacity to influence trait variation over the life course. So rather than looking at social behavior, another approach is to think about measures of physiology that we think are relevant to the baboons, like glucocorticoids something that we measure routinely in our animals. Again, we have longitudinal time series. Um, the, the work I'll show you um, now relies on about 17,000 glucocorticoid measurements in our animals over time. Um, and the earlier findings that early life adversity also predicts glucocorticoid concentrations in adulthood suggesting this sort of stable effect over time, and that glucocorticoid concentrations predict mortality rates for animals in our population, something very parallel to what I told you about for social relationships. You have these two pieces of the puzzle that look like they're pointing in the right direction as a possible mediating pathway. We can use the same um, analytical framework that I showed you for social relationships, this causal mediation model, to try and understand whether really if we stick glucocorticoids in the middle now, whether we can explain this relationship. In this version of the model slightly different data set, we again recover this major effect of early life adversity on um, adult lifespan, this big effect, oops, uh, wait, sorry, a large effect of glucocorticoid levels on lifespan, and an effect, as Stacy Rosenbaum showed previously, of early life adversity on adult glucocorticoids. But again, this arrow is actually relatively weak, meaning that this mediating effect is non-zero, but it's relatively small. And our residual effect is still pretty large in all of these models. Okay? So this is also a potential mediating pathway, but not a very strong one. The biological embedding hypothesis has perhaps been invoked most frequently, not in relationship to glucocorticoids, but actually in relationship to other types of modifications at the subcellular molecular level, and particularly differences in um, gene regulation potentially mediated by the epigenome. And with the greatest attention focused on DNA methylation, which are these just additions of um, methyl groups, carbons and three hydrogens, um, in mammals typically to cytosine bases in the genome where they are followed by guanines. And these have the potential, although they do not always, um, change the way um, that genes are expressed, that is, change the location or magnitude of the production of those gene products. Um, this has been uh, a, a target of particular interest in studies of early life effects and later life health in humans, where there have been quite a few studies that link early life experiences to differences in DNA methylation levels in adulthood. Um, in humans, this type of analysis is challenged somewhat by the fact that early life experiences are often quite correlated with the adult environment as well, and so it's often quite difficult to explain differences in DNA methylation as a function of early adversity and not, the, and not, not what's going on at the time of sampling. In the baboons, we have the advantage that early life experience is actually not very predictive of the environments at the time we sample our animals in adulthood, allowing us to somewhat break apart this piece of the puzzle 
And then, of course, the second requirement for this to be a real thing is that differences in DNA methylation also have those functional effects on gene regulation, which is often not tested. So we sought um, to, to actually do this type of test um, in our population as well. Um, which is something that we can do because despite the fact that most of our data are collected non-invasively through those sorts of observational methods I mentioned earlier, occasionally we do immobilize animals uh, in Ambicelli in order to collect blood, take morphometrics, and other types of biological sampling that actually that works just sort of like this. This is Kinua, who you met earlier, um, looking very, very innocent. He's actually carrying a, a blow gun, which is about a meter long, um, a metal tube in his right hand, and he's trying to act like it's a normal morning. And when there's um, no one looking, and that's really the tricky part, everybody has to be looking elsewhere, then he'll raise that blow gun, um, breath propel a dart that is preloaded with veterinary anesthetic, and then we wait for the baboon to go down, usually in the space of just a couple of minutes, and move it to a space where we can collect blood samples and other sorts of things. So all of this work was done with blood samples collected from animals in our population that we had also watched at the beginning of their lives. This was part of um, my former student Jordan Anderson's PhD thesis, where he measured genome scale, DNA methylation levels, at 477,000 sites across the baboon genome in about 250 individuals where um, we had blood samples collected over time. This really should be pre-printed by now, but any, any moment. I mean, any moment now, it'll be out. And he looked at um, five of those major sources of early life adversity I talked about earlier, um, as well as differences in habitat quality early in life. Um, our baboons have actually experienced a major rain shift during the course of the study from a relatively degraded environment within Ambicelli National Park to a space outside of the um, park where the acacia groves that they depend on are in much better shape. After the move, they experienced earlier maturation, shorter inner birth intervals, um, otherwise looked healthier and happier. And that difference in um, resource base mediated by habitat quality, we had reason to believe in a previous study um, might, might impact what was going on with these animals too. So all of these are sort of individually structured, meaning individuals living in the same group at the same time might experience very different lives. And this is basically cohort structured in a, in a big way. We controlled for adult social status at the time of sampling, as well as the age of these individuals at the time of sampling, which we know have fairly large, fairly pronounced effects on measures of gene regulation in our population. Um, to cut to the results, the major thing that we found is that early life effects on DNA methylation, or at least associations with DNA methylation in adulthood, persist um, in, in a quite clear way for those individuals who are born in low resource quality environments. So here I'm showing you the distribution of standardized betas of simply effect sizes for CPG sites, for targets of DNA methylation in the baboon genome that are associated with early life adversity at some sort of minimal threshold in er for individuals born into high quality habitat, low quality habitat, or both. And what you can see is those effect sizes are much larger for individuals born in low quality habitat than individuals born into high quality habitat where really they're centered on zero, meaning we're really not seeing anything for those individuals. And we see the same kind of pattern when we look at any individual source of early life adversity as well. So what it looks like to us is that that low quality resource base is compounded by other sources of individually experienced early adversity to magnify um, the detectable effects on the methylome. Um, here you can see another version of seeing the same kind of thing. This is the effect size of cumulative adversity on DNA methylation um, in the high quality environment. There's really nothing here. And this is how those effect sizes for the same sites change for individuals born in a low quality environment. And if it's helpful to look at individual CPG sites, that's what I'm showing you here. Drought exposed individuals, yes or no, born in high quality habitat in purple or low habitat quality in peach. There just isn't any difference for individuals who um, weren't exposed, but a big difference for individuals who were exposed to drought um, and differences in habitat quality, okay? 
we can sort of look at the magnitude of the effect of different sources of early adversity um, across different measures of adversity in our population. This is, the, this is the number of CPG sites across the baboon genome associated with each of these predictors on the left, where LQ is being born in the low quality resource base um, and HQ is that high quality resource base. We only really see signal for individuals who are born in those low quality environments. And what we see in particular are signals that have to do with whether individuals were faced with severe resource deprivation early in life, nutritional deprivation, caloric deprivation, and so on. Um, this, by the way, is the difference between what the ecosystem looked like in the same spot in the 1960s when Stuart and Jean first went out to see where a good place to study baboons would be and what, that, um, what those groves or lack thereof looked like in 1981. So that's the type of difference we're talking about. We see a lot of effects for drought in this environment as well. Um, consistent with the sort of dichotomy that researchers working on humans often make between sources of early life adversity that represent threat versus sources of early life adversity that represent deprivation. Here, I think that um, we're seeing a strong polarization to deprivation as opposed to things like being born to a low social status mother, something that might perhaps map better on to, um, to uh, cues of threat. Um, one thing that we found interesting is that we could take those DNA methylation levels sampled when those baboons were adults, when we darted them, and use them to predict the early life habitat quality of the animals from whom those samples were obtained. And that's just shown here. This is an elastic net regression for those of you who might be interested. And it separates individuals born in poor habitat quality environments pretty well from those born um, after the shift in high quality environments. And this is the sort of ROC curve for that prediction, predicted accuracy. This is perhaps not surprising because I told you that early life adversity measured this way is associated with thousands of CPG sites in the genome, so there should be a lot of predictive power here. What we found interesting is that this predictive power attenuates with distance from the, the, from the range shift. So here is the time in days since the habitat shift when those animals were actually sampled, and this is predicted habitat quality, and that discriminative ability that we have very close to the habitat shift sort of goes away over time, suggesting that these patterns are being overwritten by an individual's own experience in adulthood. Um, so all of this may be completely irrelevant to um, differences in health and mortality in the baboons later in life if those differences in DNA methylation don't actually do anything. I sort of told you earlier that a requirement for this as a mediating pathway is that epigenetic change influences phenotype, and typically that would be expected to go through a path first through differences in gene expression. That kind of causal arrow is very, very difficult for us to get at in the sort of natural field system that we work in. And so we turned to some um, tools from uh, functional genomics to try to come up with a way that we could merge our information with very, very controlled in vitro assays to get at whether the differences that we are observing were likely to have functional consequences. So this is an assay that we call MSTARSEQ, developed by my former graduate student, Amanda Lea. Um, basically, the way it works is you take some baboon DNA, in our case, and you break it up, either chemically or mechanically, and then you clone it into these little circular pieces of DNA um, called plasmids, a vector. And these plasmids are specially designed so that they have no CPG sites in them themselves. So the only potential targets of DNA methylation are introduced in that fragmented baboon genome that you stuck into the little circular piece. And then you can use um, a bacterial enzyme to totally methylate those sites or leave them totally unmethylated. Then you kind of shock some cells. We use um, um, a blood-derived cell line for most of this work and um, shove in those plasmids carrying all different fragments of the baboon genome, either totally methylated or totally unmethylated, into their nuclei. They will um, interact with the regulatory apparatus of the cell, and if those um, inserted regions have regulatory activity, what they'll actually do is loop around interact with their own promoter region and drive transcription of this sort of fake gene um, in vitro, including their own sequence. And by self-transcribing, we can take that sequence, 
map it back, see, put it on a high throughput sequencer, and then map it back to the original baboon genome, where regions where we see a lot of fragments are regions that have a lot of regulatory activity. And we're, what we're looking for in particular are not only regions that are capable of regulatory activity, this is sort of like how enhancers function, but regions where that regulatory activity is affected by whether or not it's in a methylated sta state or in an unmethylated state. Okay, so we did that um, for a whole bunch of the baboon genome. Um, we, we have this sort of sham unmethylated condition and this methylated condition being run side by side. We measure the transcription coming off these plasmids, these self-transcribed fragments. We also measure the DNA coming from these plasmids so we can control for the amount of input we stuck into the cells in the first place. And then we compare them. And we're looking for interesting peaks like this. These are real data from um, uh, some experiments that we did. This is a methylation dependent regulatory region where if the fragment was not methylated, there's tons of expression activity. And if it was methylated, it is completely shut down. And this is a non-random spot of the baboon genome because it falls exactly on a region where we know that in the actual field population, there's an association between early life adversity, in this case drought, and methylation levels at this site. So this is like very artificial. Right? This is a very artificial in vitro um, uh, setting, but allows us to uh, derive a little bit more interpretive power about the differences that we observe in the wild population. And of course, what I like as someone who's driven primarily by what happens in the real world is that what happens in the real population give us some justification for why we spent several years trying to figure out how to do this in the first place. Right? It suggests that our in vitro results are perhaps somewhat relevant. So if we take all those data together, what do we find? Well, we find um, pretty strong evidence that certain sources of early adversity, but not all of them, including ones that we think of as very important to the lives of these baboons, like maternal loss, are predictive of differences in DNA methylation in adulthood. And drought, in particular, is, is a lovely source of early life adversity because it is definitely uncorrelated, you know, the amount it rains um, in one year with what happens throughout the adult lifespans of these animals when we sample them. So that piece is sort of partially checked in our population. And using the MSTAR-seq assay, what we've been able to show is that regions that are associated with early life adversity are somewhere between 1.25 and 1.7 times more likely to alter regulatory activity than background regions that don't show that association. Um, this is highly significant in a, in a genome scale assay, but I just want to point out that it's actually not that big. And so what that also means is that there are tens of thousands of sites that we can associate with social status or age or early life adversity that show absolutely no evidence for activity in this type of assay. So both of these pieces check out, but I think although we used a different type of interpretive framework here, they're very consistent with what I told you about the social relationship hypothesis and the glucocorticoid hypothesis. Yes, there's some evidence that this is not a nothing. No, this does not explain by itself this very strong relationship between early adversity and survival. If anything, it's just one more contributing factor. And so where we are right now, after about eight or nine years of trying to work on this, is coming to a place where we believe that there may in fact be no smoking gun. And in fact, what we're seeing is the integrated effects of many kinds of differences that early life adversity, exposure to early life disadvantage leads to in the lives of these baboons that range from the molecular level to the physiological level to the social behavioral level. And none of these things alone will um, pop up, including the ones that we have not tested yet, as strong mediating pathways. But because they act in different individuals, on different time scales, um, potentially with regards to different sorts of causes of death. It's the fact that there's many, many, many different things together that helps explain this effect on all-cause mortality on the right-hand side. So that's where we are right now. Um, and so I'll end by you know, asking the question that really has been the motivation for all the work I've told you about today, and arguably is the motivation for the 50 plus years of research that's been done on Ambicelli to begin with, which is understanding 
why some baboons do well and some baboons do poorly. And of course, a simple answer is, well, it's a combination of genes and environment, right? Um, but what I find um, actually a little nice about our emerging results is that uh, although as evolutionary biologists we're taught um, about the naturalistic fallacy, right, that the things that um, natural selection may favor over evolutionary time are in no way things that we should interpret as good or ethical or desirable in our own lives. What we've been learning is that, at least for females in our population, what makes a successful baboon um, are, uh, are, are things that are closely related to what I think many of us think makes a successful life for, our, for ourselves, right? So being born in a secure and well-resourced early environment having a lot of good, stable friendships as an adult, living a long lifespan surrounded by kin and offspring, um, which conveniently um, both makes us, um, makes this system a very nice model for understanding the sorts of things that matter to our own species, and also maybe is a, is a little bit um, of a reassurance that uh, selectively mediated change and the products of evolution can produce things that favor really rather quite, quite comforting and nice outcomes, at least for some of the animals in our population as well. Um, so with that, I just want to thank lots of people involved in this work, especially um, Susan and Beth, who are my fellow travelers on all things baboon related, um, our, our data team and lab technicians, our observers in the field, our many partners and collaborators in Kenya, and the lots of people, including ones that I've probably left off this list, but these are some of our major collaborators um, and former students on the project, um, and of course, uh, funding sources. Um, and I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Yeah, so Maggie's going to take the questions because I have to run to provide parental care quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> and we know how important that is. <laughs> so questions for Jenny from the audience? I'm going to start then. Okay. So you sort of started out your talk talking about the importance of these of early life adversity or ACEs in humans, yeah. um, and then sort of showed these surprising patterns through, for me at least, through through the baboon stuff. That it's more the, the environmental challenges seem mm. to be more important in some ways than the social challenges, at least for certain of these for pathways. some things and not others. Yeah. Yes. And so I was curious if you could sort of tie that back in to to what we know about human. Yeah. Aces and both um, whether you think that sort of this this general picture of multiple weak mediators is probably true for human early life adversity impacts, yeah, yeah. Um, and also sort of the relative importance of maybe broadly classed social versus environmental yeah. challenges. Right. Okay. So that's a lot, but yeah. let me see if I can if I can cover the bases, and if I don't, you can you can protest. Um, so. So one of the things, I, I have been really inspired in ways that I didn't expect in my career by work that's being done by human social scientists who, who considers them, who, who think about themselves as, as population scientists. They have taken everything that we've described <laughs> about the major predictors of, um, of lifespan and mortality, and they described it like 100 years ago with bigger sample sizes than we will ever, ever get to. I mean, I'm really talking about, I was telling Michael about um, some work on, um, on life course studies that a collaborator of mine does that's about 20,000 people studied about over the life course, and that's not even that big, right? Um, and, and yet, they have had a very hard time understanding what these mediating pathways are. The phenomenon is extremely robust, extremely large, and extremely replicable. And so I would hazard a, a somewhat uninformed guess that yes, the, that they probably too are, are getting a multiple weak mediation pathway. And I think that may be one of the reasons why for both social relationships and for early life adversity, these two major social determinants of health that we really, really know happen in humans, that they haven't been much of a, st of, of, of a topic of study for people, broadly speaking, working in the biological sciences. And I think it's because they're so confusing in a way that's related to this multiple week mediation thing, which is to say that, you know, so, so for, for uh, 
for a biologist who's working on, um, say, tuberculosis as a source of bad things that happen to humans and is a, is a major cause of mortality in some populations. There's this very nice relationship between tuberculosis and mycobacterium tuberculosis. And mycobacterium tuberculosis, tuberculosis causes tuberculosis and it does not go off and cause renal disease, right? Whereas here, you know, part of the thing that's so interesting about what's going on, and the, our best data here again are from humans where there's really good cause of death data, early life adversity effects cancer risk? Well, cancer risk. I mean, cancer is a bunch of different diseases in and of itself. And it affects cardiovascular disease, and it affects diabetes, and it affects stroke. And so it almost doesn't make sense, right? What do you study then if the etiology of these diseases at a proximal level is so different, and yet they're all predicted by these pathways? And one potential reason that's happening is because early life adversity is doing a lot of different things. And so each one of those will only account for a fraction of, of the overall um, years of life lost. But um, combined, they have this big fat effect. Because if your liver doesn't kill you, you know, your brain will or your heart will or something. And so it's, on one hand, very unsatisfying right, for, for biologists to, to um, to try and put your hooks in something to study, because it affects everything. Yeah. Um, but I think that's perhaps maybe the, the truth. And so when you say it looks like some of this stuff is a lot more sort of ecological or environmental rather than social, honestly, I think that depends on, on the outcome variable that we're looking at. Um, I didn't talk about it, but for example, early life adversity that leads to loss of social status in adulthood um, in females, we have a very easy explanation for that. Like your mom died, and your mom has a very fundamental role to play in helping you attain the rank that you're supposed to, you're supposed to attain in a society like ours. That's a purely easy social explanation. But other things are not like that. And so we're getting this very difficult to tie a neat bow around set of results that increasingly push us towards there's not there's not a single answer but there's a lot of stuff that's going on yeah cool thank you thanks my question is a bit of a follow-up on that one which is you started with this nice framework of the ACEs framework where you kind of add up the insults in early life and then I feel like your talk sort of in, as you went along began picking it apart and that what you found is that you know well actually and when we look at this particular yeah. you know mediator it's yeah. not only associated with some of these early life outcomes so, or early life effects um, or so I, I wonder if your is, is your kind of conclusion the, of the way forward to be that we should do a little bit less lumping in terms of um, looking at early life adversity as a category and yeah. instead st just start to pick apart early life adversity in these you know different domains and how they relate to these mediators and maybe sort of what you alluded to at the end also in terms of how those relate to different types of mortality. Yeah, yeah I think I'm a very like why not both person. Um, so typically in those analyses we're looking at both cumulative or, or uh, cumulative adversity and individual sources of adversity. Um, but it seems to be like a very natural way to, pre I mean we just, we did that because the, you know, our colleagues working in sociology and social epidemiology and psychology were like this works really well. And we were like, this makes no sense, right? You're just lumping a bunch of things that don't look the same together. And it had remarkable predictive power. And that was great. But then immediately the second generation of questions will be, and why is that? And then so I think naturally you start picking it apart again. Yeah. And are you, are you sort of thinking about also picking apart the different causes of mortality and <laughs> trying to, yeah, distinguish that pathway and that on the right hand side as well? That would be great. Our data on causes of death are not great, right? Um, because death usually for us means disappearance. Sometimes we find a body, but not very often, you know, because hyenas and things like that um, get to them before, before we do. Um, and even if you know that the the last cause of death was predation. It was probably preceded by a number of things that made that individual more vulnerable to predation. Um, and we don't do uh, full autopsies with the animals that we study anyway. 
I've started talking a little bit to Fabian Landertz and the people at you know the Helmholtz Institute for One Health about doing a little bit more monitoring in our population, certainly for pathogens, which almost certainly have to be affecting them, but we're pretty blind to. Um, and so you may know that in some of their work on other populations, they ended up discovering that you know 40% of these deaths are all anthrax. You just can't tell with just observational stuff. So, it, uh, so I don't want to exclude the possibility that we'll have a better understanding of causes of death in the future. But right now, that's not. Unfortunately, it's really not a strength of, of our study system, and and I would dare to say it's not really a strength of most um, field studies. Yeah. Thanks. Really cool to see it all tied together. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Wonderful talk. I was wondering about the social circle of the animals. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know how much this relates to your work, but I was thinking like uh, the likelihood that one individual will have a nice social circle, do you think it depends more on uh, how they look like and how good they are at uh, attaining food or other things or in their ability to create social bonds behaviorally in the sense that, I don't know if they are grooming each other, but like... yeah. Uh, so I didn't explain yeah. this, and I should have, I'm sorry. All of our social um, affiliation metrics, whether they're social bond metrics or other sort of measures of general social integration, are based on grooming behaviors. So that is the, the, the actual observed set of things that we're using to sort of infer the, the, the affiliative social relationships between our animals. Um, so strong social bonds are bonds that are cemented by uh, an unusually high level of grooming between dyads, right? Those are your social partners, strongest social partners. Um, in terms of what predicts who's good at that and who's not good at that, um, there's a lot of variance that remains unexplained by what I'll tell you now. But in, in females, in terms of their social connections with other females, they are heavily kin biased. So just having a lot of close kin around um, is a, a non-trivial predictor of whether you'll have close social relationships for female relationships with other females. For female relationships with other males, which are not very well correlated with female relationships with other females, but both seem to independently predict survival, um, uh, our predictive ability is not great, but the most consistent thing that we see is that high-ranking females are often a bit more likely to form close social relationships with males. And high-ranking males and high-ranking females tend to affiliate assortatively. That suggests to us that actually, because this is a, a partly rank-mediated, it looks like it's partially rank-mediated, that male social partners are a resource that females actually are excluding each other from, which is an idea that's been pursued um, quite a bit in, in some work on Chakma baboons at Salbis. Um. Really interesting. And the dominance rank, how is it established? OK, By so yes, <laughs> sorry. I left out a lot of fundamental information about baboons that's pertinent to this work. So dominance rank is established in different ways for males and females in, in these baboons, in the baboons that we study. Um, in males, it's determined by fighting ability and physical condition. So males leave their natal groups when they reach maturity. Um, and then they physically compete against other adult males in order to attain um, high status if they ever make it there. And so for males, if you look at sort of the relationship between age and status, it's kind of in this, this like sort of in, inverted U shape where it's males in that sort of the peak condition of their lives that tend to be the highest status individuals and then they fall as they, as they age. Dominance rank in males is therefore very dynamic. There's a lot of change in hierarchies um, over, over years. Female hierarchies are very stable. Um, and females who stay in their groups throughout their lives um, insert in the hierarchy below their mothers. So actually, younger sisters will tend to outrank older sisters because of this insertion below moms in the hierarchy. So female hierarchies can be somewhat stable even across multiple generations because of this matrilineal inheritance structure. Um, and within a group, you'll see closely related females sort of in a block, and then another matriline in a block, and then another matriline in a block. So yeah, this is not an unusual um, sort of way of hierarchy determination in um, this particular branch of primates, but you see it sometimes elsewhere too, like in spotted hyenas. Uh, thank you for the 
elaborate explanation. And what I really w was wondering about initially <laughs> yeah. was whether this uh, physical strength or your inheritance of uh, dominance hierarchy in the end influences your social uh, interactions and lifespan. Ah, yeah. So this is a, so we actually spent a lot of time studying social status too. I just didn't talk about that work today. And social status is quite important to. So let me just talk about females because we're, we're much better able to, to measure lifetime reproductive success in females because we know when they die um, and we know where they've been throughout their lives. Um, we think both social status and affiliative social relationships are important predictors of life outcomes. But in multiple analyses now, we have never seen a relationship between social status and lifespan. Just not even close to there for the females. And we do see effects of social status on fertility-related um, measures. They have slightly shorter interbirth intervals. They reach menarche at an earlier age. So there are consequences to dominance for the females that translate in much more subtle ways to fitness-related outcomes. But it seems to be, it's like if I was going to simplify it, I would say right now what it looks like is that dominance rank in females matters for fertility. And social relationships matter for survival. And they are correlated for female relationships with males, but not particularly strongly so. So they're moving relatively independently in our population. Really interesting. Thanks a lot. Sure. Um. Can I follow up with a question? Yeah. So social relationships seem to impact longevity. Yeah. What's the mechanism? Oh, I don't know. I spent the whole time with, OK, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we've spent a lot of time doing this kind of no. thing, too. Well, do social relationships predict glucocorticoids? Yeah. Do glucocorticoids predict survival? Yeah. Do glucocorticoids predict the relationship between social relationships and survival? Eh, you know, and, and so the same kinds of things that I'm showing, we, we don't know. What, what is interesting is that, uh, well, one of the things, not that that's not interesting, it's just I don't know the answer to it, so I'm going to divert <laughs> from that question right now. One of the things that I find interesting, and this also is preceded by work in humans, where they measure social support and social integration in like a zillion different ways, and different measures of social support and social integration are actually not very well correlated, and yet they both predict lifespan. Um, that we can, we, we, um, there's some work by a former postdoc of Susan's, Fernando Campos, which is gradually making its way through the manuscript script phase, um, which takes different measures of social relationships. You know, overall, how much do you groom? Or how strong are your relationships to your three best friends? Or, you know, how central are you in a sort of social network sense? And compares their predictive um, relationship with, with survival. And again, some of these are not actually particularly closely correlated with each other. For example, I think that the, the amount of time that an individual just grooms irregardless of partner, is not very closely connected to the strongest social bonds. They both predict survival. But if you're going to pick one, the, the sort of strength of the strongest social bonds seems to be the most important. But that doesn't explain to you the mechanism. But it suggests that there are multiple mechanisms. I guess that's what, I'm, what I, I wanted to come back to. Because you have multiple measures, they're both about affiliative relationships, and they're both predicting survival, but they're not the same thing, there's multiple things going on there, too. There have to be. And some people have argued that like sort of social integration sort of measures are probably more like predation related, like standing in the middle of a big group, you know, maybe that's that's about things like not getting eaten, whereas social bonds are something a bit different. Um, yeah, obviously I don't know the answer to this, but um, in that, interestingly, Susan reminded me recently that in in when that Silk et al. paper, the first paper on Marimi and social bonds and survival was published, um, the sort of news and views perspective -y piece that was written on that was about the, you know partly pointed out that there's like all of this like elaborated socio ecological framework for understanding social integration, which has a lot to do with predation mm -hmm. risk, um, and none of that actually tells us why social bonds should exist. So I think that's a, a challenge right, to, to those of us who are interested in these kinds of things to understand better. Other questions for Jenny? I'm going to greedily ask one more then. Okay. <laughs> if there's nothing online. Anything online? No? OK. So you showed us some pretty compelling evidence that drought really matters. I think drought really matters. Really matters. And drought is becoming more and more common and is predicted to become 
even more and more common as the yeah. years go by in this part of Kenya. Yeah. So in a totally speculative way, what do you think that means for the evolutionary pressures and trajectories of this species? Because the impact that you're showing on fitness-related measures is really quite strong. Right. So I suppose that, you know, first pass, it would suggest that there's going to be stronger selection for drought resilience, you know, for those animals who can cope better with drought than others. Um, I will say, though, that at the same time that drought is changing this ecosystem, there's a bunch of other things that are changing the ecosystem as well. For example, um, the density of large predators or predators that would take baboons has dropped off in the last uh, couple of decades. The density of humans has increased. And um, Beth has a paper that was just published the last year or two that look at rates of human baboon conflict um, and where those tend to happen and why. And they actually make the interesting argument that because Maasai living in that population have dug wells to feed their cattle, that the existence of those wells as stable water sources is actually what's allowing the baboons to persist in this very drought prone area of the world. But it also increases human wildlife conflict and makes it much more likely that baboons will be killed by humans. So I think that that change is going to be very hard to isolate from, um, from all the other stuff that is happening in our population at the same time. But one interesting thing that, would be inter that I would find interesting to revisit, I didn't mention it here, but our, our population is all hybrids. Um, and they're hybrids between uh, the, the species that Meg, you study, and um, another species, the yellow baboon. And people have made arguments that have not been strongly substantiated by data, but are interesting arguments that yellow baboons are perhaps more adapted to um, less forested, more arid environments, and they certainly have lighter pelage color, which is at least circumstantial support. So one possibility is that drought resilience will differ depending on the, the genetic background of, of the animals in our population, which would be a fun thing to study. Yeah. Cool. OK, if there are no more questions, please join me in thanking Jenny for a fantastic talk. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much, Jenny.